Good morning, God's people. This is uh, Sunday, April the 11th. This is, ti this is the time to worship. And uh, let us gather uh, around our television set, tablet, uh, whatever device, uh, your computer, that uh, the Lord has uh, privileged you to use. And let us really now worship the Lord our God. The psalmist said in Psalm 27, uh, in verse 1, uh, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We are entering the presence of our Lord with such attitude this morning, an attitude of worship and a fearless attitude before him. Let us turn to the word that the Lord sent for us this morning. It is found in uh, Luke chapter 24. We will be reading verse 1 to verse 11. Luke chapter 24, reading verse 1 to verse 11. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone was rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the man said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man, he said, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But when they did not, but they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over to saw the strip of linen laying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. The word of the Lord. This is the Sunday after Easter. And this morning we are going to focus uh, is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ a, a fairy tale, a story to tell our children, or was it real? Stay tuned. Before we get in there, let us go to the Lord in prayer. We have much to pray about. We have much to give him thanks for. So we are inviting you to now go with us into the very presence of the Lord as we pray together. We encourage you as you pray to bring uh, your family before the Lord, to bring your uh, community before the Lord, and to bring uh, your friends as well, and your brothers and sisters in Christ, in the household of faith, to really bring them before the Lord in prayer. We want prayer to be meaningful to you. 
because in prayer we have direct contact with our God and we know that our God is able and he does hear and answers to our prayers. So let us really go before him this morning and confidence that our God hears and he answers our prayer. And as we pray, he listens. Shall we pray together? We have heard the call to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. This morning, we come before you expressing gratitude for life and all of its gifts and singing of praise for the wonder of your love and the wonder of your grace. Draw us near in the sacred hour as we seek to understand your ways more fully and learn of Christ's love more completely. Hear our sacred utterances, our prayers as we join them with the believers of the ages who learn from Jesus. Yes, Father, Lord of all the ages, we are thankful this morning for the delicate beauty of uh, burgeoning spring, the whisper of scented breeze returning, the music of a song bird drifting on the evening air, the mystery of new birth as the lilies start growing and the trees are budding again. We are thankful for our hearts touched by the cries of starving children. Hands open and help to those living in poverty. Fortunes invested in lifting the heavy loads of the overburdened. We are thankful, O oh, Heavenly Father, for the discoveries that make life easier to live, good drugs to bring permanent healing, like the vaccine that you have provided for us and have provided for the rest of the world, medicines to keep us functioning when wellness can come to us no more. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, for visionaries who inspire us, historians who keep us aware of our heritage and life's mysteries, good teachers who educate us in the management of life to a better degree than we would be able in our own wisdom. Oh, we pause this morning and thank you for the many Sunday school teachers that we have not seen for a while, but we pray for them and the input they have had in our lives. We are thankful for the freedom with all its responsibilities, love with all its entanglements, family with all its mowings, faith with all its many facets. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, for the Christ without whom we would be forever lost, for the church without which we would lose our way. For faithful Christians, 
faithful Christian friends without whom we would lose our courage in the face of struggle. Our hearts are full of, of thankfulness to you this morning that we serve a raising Savior who is in the world today. We know it because he walked with us. He talked with, with us along the narrow ways of life. As we come again this morning, we empty ourselves before you in humility. Please fill us with your goodness. Fill us up with your word so that we may be equipped for the rest of the day and for the week to come and years to come. To that end, we pray and give you all the glory for Jesus' sake. Amen. This morning, God's words come to us from the book of Luke, the book of Luke in, the, in the 24th chapter. We want to speak about the reality of the resurrection. Uh, that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is not really just a story, a nice story to tell on Easter Sunday to our children or even to ourselves. We want to talk about the reality. Perhaps maybe you are one of those who are really pondering and you've been pondering for years. Was the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ a reality or just something mysterious that people talk about and there are no proof for it? So listen on as we go through God's words together. The title of my sermon to you this morning is the reality of the resurrection. My text is found in Luke chapter 24 and verse 11. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. It is nothing new to our ladies' friends and our ladies that are our sisters and our mothers that uh, they, they, there has been this sinfulness in us men that would not believe you, that would render your words to be nonsense and not paying attention to it. So that when, when the women uh, came and gave the good news of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ to the rest of the disciples, they have counted it as nonsense. Was it real? Are we still suffering from the same situation that the disciples have suffered from? Is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, is it real? Or is it, or is it just a story to be told? The woman soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross. Let us have a revision of what we have celebrated as Christians last weekend. We have celebrated Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. The Roman soldiers nailed Jesus on that cross on that Good Friday at 9 a.m. By 3 p.m. in the afternoon of the same day, he was dead. Friends came to take Jesus' body. They wrapped it in burial linens and laid it in a tomb. But there was no time for the usual burial ritual that usually the Hebrews, the Jewish people, would have carried out for their loved ones. 
They wrapped it in burial linen and laid it in a tomb. But there was no time for that burial, for that ritual, for the usual thing to take place. The Jewish Sabbath was only a, a few hours away and no Jews would touch a dead body on the Sabbath. That was the Saturday. But it would make that person ceremonially unclean and prohibit him or her from participating in the Sabbath observance. And that would have been catastrophic to the Jewish believers. So therefore, they had to try to get rid of the body in a very early time so that they could do at least the, their best what they could do for the Savior. So when the Sabbath day was over, early on Sunday morning, devout women went to, the, to, the, to Jesus' tomb with spices and ointment out of respect, out of love and honor. They wanted to perform the formal rites associated with the burial. When they arrived at the tomb, they found that the massive stone had been rolled away from the entrance. And when they entered the tomb, they did not find Jesus' body. Two angelic messengers informed them that Jesus Christ had risen. They were the first to discover the reality of the resurrection. I want you to think as we go through the message this morning, should you have been these women? You were the first to have realized, to have discovered the reality of the resurrection. What would you have done? You still know the risen Savior even today. What have you done? They have discovered the greatest news of the universe. The women rush back to where the disciples were meeting and told them about the reality of the resurrection. The disciples had a strange response to the women's message. As our text tells us in Luke chapter 24 and verse 11, their words seem to them as idle tales and they believe them not. They did not believe the women. The expression idle tales comes from the Greek medical writers who use it to describe the babbling, the babbling of a fevered and insane mind. In another word, they have decided that these women are crazy. Does that sound strange to you, my sisters? Often your wisdom is not appreciated, is not taken. Your wisdom is not really, uh, does not make sense to either your partner or your children or the world all around you. You are not alone. The, these women that have gone to the tomb that morning, that have discovered the reality of the resurrection when they brought the news to the rest of the disciples. Instead, 
of appropriating it. Instead of listening to them, they thought these women were crazy. They dismissed them as being crazy. So, therefore, we have not changed much in our world, have we? The woman could have been very discouraged because of really the reaction of their brothers when they brought the news of news to them that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was our reality. So the disciples were not convinced of the resurrection. Still today, many people do not believe in the resurrection. As a matter of fact, there are so-called Christian churches all around us, liberal churches that do not believe in the resurrection. There are those who call themselves Christians that would even be gathered in a church to worship but do not believe in the resurrection. Is the resurrection of Jesus Christ a reality for you? The gospel account seems to many as an idle tale. But Christians know that Jesus is alive for his spirit lives in them. Therefore, they can be bold about affirming the reality of Christ's resurrection to those around them. First, please look at some of the evidence of the reality of the resurrection with me. First, let us look at the, the touch of personal experience. Nothing can be more convincing than a personal experience. No one can refute your experience. Seeing the empty tomb and hearing the angelic messengers convince the women visitors of the reality of the resurrection. They needed no apologetic proof to convince them or to persuade others that Jesus was alive. The Romans thought to nullify the Lord's resurrection. Matthew wrote in Matthew 28 in verse 12 to 13, Matthew wrote, And when they were assembled with the elders, and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. The Jews used treachery to arrest Jesus Christ. Then they tried him in an illegal on false charges. Illegally they have charged him. There was no sense on the charges that they have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And now they're trying to pay off soldiers to make up a lie that while they were sleeping uh, his disciples came in the middle of the night to stole the body of Jesus Christ from them. Then they, they then now Jesus' enemies use bribery to silence the news of the resurrection. So I don't know nowadays what people would do around you to silence you so that you would not speak to them about the good news of the gospel that God 
in his mighty power has raised his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. Yet not any of the machinations of malicious people could express the re could really suppress the risen Lord. No forces in the world can suppress the powerful dynamic message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Briefly, bribery could not silence the news about him. Roman guards could not contain him in a cave. Jesus presented himself alive to people. They experienced him personally. He met with them, ate with them, and taught them. These personal experiences of the risen Lord furnish conclu conclusive evidence of his resurrection from the dead. Further, Christians today are convinced of the reality of Jesus' resurrection by having a personal experience with him. When we open our lives to the risen Christ as Christians, we can testify of his living presence. Don't try to tell me that my God is dead. I just spoke to him today. He woke me up this morning. Don't try to tell me that he is not alive because he lives within my soul. Secondly, we have as evidence of the reality of the resurrection, the testimony of scripture. Another convincing factor of Jesus' resurrection is the testimony of Scripture. When the women came to the tomb, the angelic messengers reminded them of Jesus' promise of resurrection. Throughout the New Testament, there are numerous references to it. The New Testament gives a uh, on unified testimony. The gospel relate in the simple narrative the events of Jesus' resurrection. Some critical scholars want to emphasize the differences evident in the four narratives. But upon close examination of the gospels, one can explain these variations. Why the different gospel writers have written their portion of the resurrection a little bit different from their point of view. The book of Acts frequently mentioned Jesus' resurrection. When Peter preached at the feast of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, in verse 32. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 32, he said, This Jesus has God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. Later, the risen Christ appeared to Saul, whom he renamed Paul. He said to Saul in Acts chapter 9 and verse 5, I am Jesus. As we read Acts, we notice numerous testimonies regarding the risen Christ. The various New Testament letters give a unified witness of Jesus' resurrection. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3 to 5, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also receive, 
that all that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, in that he was buried, in that he rose again to the third day according to the scriptures. Peter himself in in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 3, Peter mentioned the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. John the, the Revelator, in Revelation chapter 1, in verse 18, John recorded the, the words of the risen Lord, I am he that live and was dead. The New Testament References to Jesus' resurrection are really straightforward. There is no elaborate language and there is no adornments to, to the story. So, so visionary experience. Another unique factor of the New Testament account is the verb tense. The biblical writers speak of Jesus after his death in the present tense. Look at Colossians chapter 18, chapter 8 and verse 18. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. One notable example is Paul's testimony of Jesus. He said, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead. Several other unique factors can really seen in the New Testament account of Jesus' resurrection. The full dead grave clothes prove that Jesus' body had not been stolen. The clothes he was wearing was still in the tomb, not just thrown here and there. It was in order, folded, put in a corner as an evidence for you and for me of the reality of that resurrection. Scripture also carefully recorded that Jesus has scars on his body where he had been nailed to the cross. This clearly established evidence of his identity. Furthermore, his words and actions are recorded by scripture, testifying that the Christ who died on the cross was truly alive. If you desire to learn of the reality of the resurrection, make a serious study of the Holy Scriptures. The Bible will convince you of the reality of the risen Lord. He is alive. The Bible tells us so. You can today be convinced of the reality of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you seek him, you will find him. If you seek him with all your heart and sincerity, you will find the truth. This is not a story to read at bedtimes to our children. It is not fictionary. It is a reality that God in his mighty power have raised our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the dead. But thirdly, we want to consider the transformation of people. People were transformed after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we observe how the risen Christ transformed people, we do not doubt that the reality of the resurrection at all. 
Jesus made a difference in the lives of those first century disciples. The news of Jesus' resurrection changed the attitudes of Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary. Jesus changes temperaments. Before the resurrection, the disciples were fearful, disillusioned, disappointed, and depressed. But the resurrection of Christ transformed their, their temperaments. Jesus can also transform the feelings of modern disciples, helping them to overcome disappointment and fear in their own lives. We believe, just as we approach this wonderful time we call spring, that if any man or woman is in Christ, He's a new creation. The old things have passed away. And behold, all things are made new. We believe in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to change lives. We dare you to entrust your life to Jesus Christ. And watch the changes that he will bring in your family. Here's the difference in my family. And if you... Believe him too. He will be the difference in your family. He will be the difference in your workplace. He will be the difference in your world and in your personal life. Jesus has the power to change you from inside out. Jesus has the power to change life around you and to change your family and to change even the situation that we as a world is going through right now in COVID-19, Jesus has the power to change things. Jesus also dispelled doubts. When Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas was absent. They told him of Jesus' appearance to them, but Thomas doubted the resurrection. It seems incredible to him. After seven days, Jesus ministered specially to Thomas, dispelling Thomas' doubts. I love this part of scripture. When we think that having doubts is sinful, it is not at all. As a matter of fact, having doubt is an invitation to come to the Lord Jesus Christ to clarify things for us. Thomas had his doubts. In today's world, numerous people find the news of our risen Christ incredible. They said, it is hard to believe. It is beyond me to believe that. Yet, Christ is able to minister to them by his Holy Spirit and by his word, dispelling their doubts as he did for Thomas. I dare you come to Jesus like doubting Thomas and ask him, please reveal yourself to me. Show me the mark of the print of the nails and your hand. Dispel my doubts, dispel my fears, dispel all these that have been programmed with by friends or family or even uh, those who are in opposition to Christianity and our uh, universities and colleges and in the high school. Jesus can help you out. Seek, you will find. Knock at the door and the door will be open to you. Just like Thomas has found the answer to his quest. Go out to find Christ and you will find him. 
the risen Christ gives meaning and purpose to life. The apostle thought Jesus was the Old Testament Messiah. Basically, their messianic concept was political. When Jesus did not restore Israel as in the days of David and reign as an earthly king, they lost their direction in life. But after his resurrection, Jesus taught them the real meaning of following him. No greater malady affects our world today than meaninglessness in life. Empty lives. Lives are empty in spite of the wealth and the affluence that is all around us. Life is still empty in spite of all the technologies that we have got for ourselves and for our family and for our world. Life is still empty in spite of how much we have in the bank account. Life is empty no matter what relationship that we have found ourselves in. Life still remain empty, meaningless. Only the risen Christ can give our generation meaning and purpose. Go tell your friends, tell your family, tell the world that Jesus is alive. And it is a reality, not just a story. Live your life to prove that the risen Christ lives in you. And that, it has changed you. It has changed how your world, and it can change their world. Jesus' resurrection is a reality, not an idle tale. As the disciples have said, oh, that today in the Sunday after Easter, that I have provoked your mind and your spirit enough to go dig for Christ. Because if you search him with all your heart, I assure you, you will find him. You will find that Christ is not a tattle tale. You will find the reality of the living Christ, the greatest proof of its authenticity is for you to open your life to the risen Lord and to let him begin the process of changing you inside and out and make you a totally new person. Spring indeed remind us of the newness of life. Give yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and he will bring springtime in your life. He will make all things brand new to you. Come to him. He is waiting for you. Reach out to him. He is ready to reach out to you. Oh, may the Lord bless you in this day. As you celebrate with us this Lord's Day, the reality of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, having worship, we now go out to serve. May we have clear vision to see the opportunities that arise before us in conviction enough to set our lives to the task that the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ has left for us to do. May the Lord bless you.